good to see all of you. It's a privilege to be with you today. I am David Parks, and uh, despite what Richard said, I, I'd like to meet the guy you were introducing a while ago, if you don't mind when that time comes. I appreciate knowing somebody like that, but uh, I have a title that's a mile long. I don't like it. I don't remember it. If you'll just remember it, my name is David, and I'm one of your missionaries. That'll be good enough for all of us this morning, and so I appreciate that. I uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity and privilege to be with you today. I am an NC State graduate. I'm proudly an NC State graduate. Uh, are there any of you here who are Clemson Tiger fans? Uh, I am of your tribe. I have two, stud uh, two, stud two children who were students there and now graduates of Clemson. I've spent so much money there, I can't help but be a fan of Clemson. And for those of you that are Gamecock fans, any of you Gamecock fans? I'll try to use smaller words for you this morning just to help things out if you don't. I don't want to offend you, but uh, anyway. Uh, when I came here, I was asked, which, which school do you pull for, Clemson or Carolina? It was the last interview question, and I told the folks that were there, I said, look, at the time I didn't have students at Clemson, so I had to answer it this way. I said, look, I'm an NC State grad and proud of it. If you can't get into a world-class institution like NC State, any of those second-tier schools are fine with me. And uh, they laughed about like you all did, like, ha-ha, that ain't funny, you know. So, uh, but it's good to be with you today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share God's Word with you this morning. I hope that you'll follow along in your Bibles today as we look at Scripture together. Um, and we're going to start off in, uh, and, and stay in Luke chapter 16. And so if you'll go ahead and turn there, and I'd like us to begin this morning with a word of prayer, if we may. So will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this day that you've given to us, Lord, for the privilege of being here with these your children, and for sharing your word with them today, God. And I pray, Father, that you would speak through me, Lord, that those here, Father, would hear your voice above my own. Lord, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It can be a parent's worst nightmare. Suddenly and inexplicably, your child is missing. It can happen at an amusement park, a clothing store, a department store, or a supermarket. And this is exactly what happened to Reve and John Walsh on July the 27th, 1981, when their six-year-old son, Adam, was abducted from the Sears department store at the Hollywood Mall in Hollywood, Florida. Those of you in the over 50 crowd may well remember the tragic story of young Adam Walsh. Adam and his mother got up that morning and went to the store to shop for lamps. The store, which they frequented often, was only about a mile from their home, and they parked their car in the lot where they always parked. Holding hands, they crossed the parking lot to the north entrance of Sears, the same as they always did when they went to the store. That put them in the toy department. And right in the middle of the toys was a big attraction. It was a television monitor displaying something that brand new, computer video games. Several children were playing with the game, and Adam asked his mother, as children will, if he could stay and play too. So Reveille's mother said, okay, told him to stay right there until she returned from the lamp department. Now, the lamps <clears throat> were about 75 feet away, three aisles over, out of sight, but not very far. When Reveille got there, she learned that the lamps were out of stock, and so she left her name and contact information and returned. She was gone seven minutes, just seven minutes. When she returned for him, Adam was not at the video game. She walked down several of the aisles, calling out his name, and she realized that not only was Adam gone, but all the other children were gone as well, and the video game was silent. Well, Reve spotted a boy about Adam's age wearing the same hat that Adam had on that morning, and she asked the child if he had seen another boy wearing the same hat. He nodded yes and pointed to the west door. Reve was positive that Adam would not go out that door. They, they never went to that part of the store. He'd have no reason to wander over there. The toy department clerk said that she'd not seen Adam, and so Reve started asking anyone that she could if they'd seen her son. But they all said the same kinds of things. You know what they said, right? Oh, well, he, he probably just wandered off. I'm sure he'll turn up. I bet he went looking for you. Did you check back in the lamp department? You know how kids are. He probably just wandered off with the rest of the kids. Reve this whole time kept insisting that her son had not wandered off and that something was terribly wrong. All around her clerks were 
keep, uh, kept waiting on people as, as if nothing had happened. And finally, she was able to convince a clerk, a clerk to page her son over the PA system in the store. And so the announcement goes out, Adam Walsh, please meet your mother in the toy department. Nothing happened. After going to her car twice to look for Adam there and searching for him on her own for more than two hours, somebody finally decided to call the police department. When the police arrived on the scene, they searched them all, but no Adam. The quest continued throughout the day and into the night. Photographs and descriptions were distributed, and the evening news even gave a, a description and showed a photograph of Adam. But when morning came, he was still missing. By the end of the first week, 150,000 flyers had been printed and distributed locally. Adam's photograph, which had only been taken a week earlier, showed him with a missing front tooth. Now try to imagine, if you will, the agony of Adam's father as he contacted the FBI and discovered that they would not become involved in the rescue of his son. Or imagine the dismay of his mother when she found out that due to squabbling over jurisdiction, neighboring police departments acted indifferent and refused to help in the search for young Adam. Mind you, the Walshes were pleading for someone to help them rescue their lost child. They were begging for help. And the tragedy is that while the FBI, the police, and others remained apathetic to Adam's situation, he was tortured, dismembered, and decapitated. Sixteen days after Adam Walsh dis disappeared from that Sears store, his severed head was found in the Vero Beach Canal, and his body was positively identified through dental records. To date, almost 36 years later, no one has been indicted for the abduction and death of Adam Walsh. Police told John, his father, over the phone of his son's death, and all he could utter was this, they found my baby's head. It's an absolutely gut-wrenching story. And mind you, I'm not here to cast blame, but there was something about that mother and father begging and pleading for someone to help that touched all of our hearts in those days. In fact, that tragedy changed the way that America responds to lost children, did it not? John Walsh. That name may ring a bell in the recesses of your memory somewhere. John went on to co-found the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and later hosted a television show called America's Most Wanted. Well, let me turn the corner and draw an analogy to that. This morning, we're going to hear the pleading of someone from another dimension of existence. This, too, is a plea to rescue the lost. This, too, is a plea to save the lost. And my prayer is that it changes the way you as a church respond to the lost. You see, today we're going to hear the pleading of someone from another dimension of existence. And as the Word of God draws the veil back on that dreadful dimension of existence called hell, the plea we're going to hear, my brothers and sisters, is to rescue the lost. Now, some of you may be wondering, what are people in hell pleading for? Well, that's a great question. Well, they're pleading for two things this morning. We'll start with the first one. The first thing they're pleading for is this. They're pleading for personal rescue. Pleading for personal rescue. Look at me, look with me at Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. You follow with your eyes as I read. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. The time came when the beggar, what? What does Scripture say? Are you there this morning? What does Scripture say? The beggar, what? Died. And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also, what? Died. Now stop right there. In this narrative, the Bible contrasts the death of two men. One man who happens to be poor dies. Another who happens to be rich also dies. The idea is this. They are alike in that they both died. But the destiny of their souls after they died is as different as can be imagined. Let me interject a footnote here. 
There seems to be an awful lot of talk in our society about what death is and, 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 and just the whole movies coming out about it, books being written on it, and all kinds of discussions about it these days. Folks, death occurs when the soul is separated from the body. That's what death is. Death is the dissolving of the union between body and soul. When people die, the soul is extracted from their body, leaving behind a corpse, an empty shell. And what happens to that empty shell, that corpse? Well, typically it's buried in our country, right? A hole is dug in the ground and the body is placed in the ground where it returns to dust. But what happens to their soul when someone dies? Well, that depends entirely on a person's relationship to Jesus, doesn't it? If they've trusted Jesus as Savior, then when they die, their body goes to the grave, but their soul is immediately escorted to heaven by the angels. And that's exactly what happened to the beggar in this passage. Look at verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him where? To Abraham's side. Abraham's side is heaven. You see, he was saved. And when he died, angels carried him there. But the death of the other, of the other man when he died was dreadfully different. Verse 22 again. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now understand this. Don't miss this. Just like the poor man, this man's body was buried. But what happened to his soul? Well, the answer is in verse 23. In hell, where he was in torment. You see, this rich man had no relationship with Christ. He was not saved. And consequently, when he died, he was dispatched to hell. Have you ever thought about what hell is like? I mean, really thought about that? I've been asked that question many, many times as a pastor. Pastor, what's hell really like? Honestly, I can only tell you what the Bible has to say about that dreadful place. And Scripture uses three forces to describe hell. Number one, hell is a place of torment. Verse 23 again, in hell where he was in what? Torment. That word torment comes from the Greek word basanos. And basanos means, literally means examination by torture examination by torture. It means torment and acute pain. You see, hell is a place of torment. Secondly, the Bible teaches us that hell is a place of fire. Look at verse 24. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am tormented in this what? Fire. Some years ago, I was in a, uh, I started a church in Miami and I was in a Christian bookstore in Miami. The, the owner was a friend of mine and we were talking and a lady in the store walked up to me. She'd overheard us talking and she asked me if I could help her pick out a Bible. And I said, sure. And she holds up a blue Bible in one hand and a black Bible in the other. And she says, what's the most useful Bible to have? Don't ever ask the pastor a question like that. So I smiled at her and I reached over and I took a red Bible off the shelf. And it took her a moment like it will take some of you, but I wasn't talking about the color of the book. You see, red, green, black, brown, yellow, blue makes no difference. If you don't read this book, it does you no good. Have you ever read this book? Have you read about the fires of hell that come to life on the pages of Scripture? They do, you know. And though these flames can be easily extinguished, the fires of hell never will be. Hell is a place of fire. Thirdly, the Bible says this. Hell is a place of pleading. As soon as this man lands in hell, he begins to do what all people in hell do. He begins to plead. He begins to beg. First, he pleads for himself to be rescued. Verse 24, so he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on who? Me, me. He's pleading for himself. Help me, he cries. 
He's begging for mercy. He pleads for pity. He pleads for rescue. But for those in hell, rescue will never come. It will never come. Notice what Abraham's response is to this man's plea. Verse 25. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, a great what? Chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. That word chasm describes an, an eternal gulf of separation, an uh, impassable expanse. People in hell are separated from people in heaven by an impassable expanse, an expanse that cannot be crossed. That chasm is fixed. That chasm is unbreachable. That chasm cannot be traversed. You see, in the beginning of the passage we're looking at this morning, the rich man and Lazarus, did you notice what they were separated by? A gate. A gate. That's all that's separated, just a gate. But by the end of the story, they're separated by a gulf. You can easily step through a gate, but you can never step across this gulf. Translation, those in hell can never be rescued. Never, ever, ever be rescued. This man in hell, he begins by pleading for his own rescue, but he soon discovers that such rescue is impossible. It will never happen. And I'll be honest with you, my friends, I cannot really imagine the utter hopelessness of that discovery. And so this man in hell, he changes his, his focus and he begins to plead for others after he realizes that his own rescue is impossible. He begins to plead for people headed to where he is, he, where he is but who still have time to make things right with God and avoid the torment that he is experiencing. And that leads us to the second plea. First plea is for a personal rescue. The second plea is for others to be rescued. Look at verse 27. Scripture says this, he answered, now this is the man in hell. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. Now understand this, don't miss this, folks. He first pleads for his own rescue from hell. But once he finds out that's impossible, he begins to plead for someone to go to his father's house. Now, why would he do that? Why would he plead for someone to go to his father's house? Verse 27 again. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. Verse 28. For I have five brothers. Let him what? Warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Mark it down, my friends. The people in hell are pleading for someone to warn their loved ones about hell. They don't want their loved ones to come to that terrible, awful place. They want someone to rescue them with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. They're pleading for that. They're begging for that. Many years ago, I served a great church in Miami, Florida. Uh, and every week we went out on visitation. A lot of churches don't do visitation. I don't know if you all do that today or not, but that we went out on visitation every week. And, and uh, we'd usually go out in groups of two or groups of three. And one night we were a little short, so it was just me and the senior pastor who were going to go out together. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone visiting with the senior pastor, but if you do, guess who wants to do all the talking? It's him. You don't have to worry about saying a word. So if you ever do that, you don't want to talk, match up with your pastor. He'll do the talking for you. Well, that evening, our senior pastor, Rick, and I visited in the home of a middle-aged couple who'd recently visited our church. And as we, we, we sat there, Rick was going to do the talking, and my primary role was to, you know, keep the dog from jumping on somebody's lap or take care of kids that they're around and, and to pray, you know, just keep deal with the interruptions that may come about so that Rick could share with him uninterrupted. But mainly my role was to, aside from that, was just to pray for him and for them as he spoke with him. And so I was doing that, and 
Rick gave them the message of Christ, and they both listened very intently. And as he warned them about hell, the woman in particular began to turn pale with fear. When Rick finished giving them the message, he asked them if they'd like to invite Christ to come into their lives and be saved. The woman looked at me, and then she turned her head and looked at Rick, and still pale with fear, she says, I can't. And then she said this, I had twin daughters who were killed in an automobile accident last year. They were both outspoken in their rejection of Jesus Christ. And if what you're telling me is true, Pastor, then they're both in hell right now. Well, I got to be honest with you. At that point, I was really glad I wasn't the one doing the talking. I had no idea how to respond. I mean, what do you say to a, a mother who's lost her children and just realized they may be in hell? Well, very gently, Rick leaned over and he said, ma'am, I, I honestly can't tell you where your girls are right now. We just don't know. And I'm very, very sorry for your loss. But I can tell you this with absolute certainty. If they are in hell, they are pleading and begging for me to warn you about that terrible, awful place. They're pleading for someone like me to tell you of Jesus so that you can avoid being there with your girls. Let me bring this over to this church. You know, all of us are represented somewhere in this narrative from God's Word. Statistically speaking, a church like this, it's a safe bet that most of you here today, if not all of you, you're not pleading for personal rescue. You've already been rescued. You know the Lord. You've trusted Him, many of you, for decades. You've walked with Him for decades. You've been rescued, and you know this. But children of God, I want you to also know that there are people in hell pleading right this moment for all of us to get involved and to reach their loved ones who are headed to the same place in hell, but who still have time to get right with God. The question is this, will we respond to that plea? There are only two options here. Either we are pleading for rescue or we must respond to the pleas of others for rescue. That's it. Only options we have. Did you know that baptisms in Southern Baptist churches have dropped every year since 1999? It's almost a 20-year decline in baptisms for, for thousands and thousands of Baptist churches. In 2010, here in our state, we had the best year we've ever had in our nearly 200-year history on baptisms. That year we baptized almost 19,000 people corporately. That's the most ever in our 200-year history. And yet if we were able to maintain that all-time high average and do that every single year, it would take us 175 years to reach the state of South Carolina with the gospel. That assumes that nobody's born, nobody dies, and nobody moves in, nobody moves out. Those are all bad assumptions, by the way. 175 years to reach the state at our current rate. Every hour, every hour, four people die without Christ in South Carolina. Every hour, four people die without Christ. Each year, one quarter of all Southern Baptist churches baptize zero people. Zero. How can you call yourself a church if you don't reach lost people? I don't understand that. Almost half of our churches baptize less than 10 people each year. There are fewer than 300 Southern Baptist churches that will baptize more than 100 people each year. And the most telling facts are these. Two different studies conducted in the last little while reveal, that, that reveal this. Slightly more than 50% of those who attend church each week are actually saved. That's what Billy Graham says. And more than 90% of all Christians will, ever, will, will never lead someone to Christ. 90% of all Christians will never lead someone to Christ. What a tragedy, my friends. What a tragedy. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from Vigon Air, was once asked, will the heathen be converted to, if Christians don't witness? Spurgeon replied, the question is, are we truly saved if we don't share the gospel with the heathen? Remember I told you about John Walsh? I want you to try to imagine the agony that he experienced when he found out that the neighboring police departments would not become involved in the rescue I mean, you could probably multiply that by like a billion, and you might have some idea 
of the agony of those in hell when they look at churches that refuse to get involved in the rescue of the lost. <coughs> Excuse me. Many churches talk a, a really good game about reaching lost, but they do nothing to save them. We can really talk, oh, yes, we need to reach the lost. We need to do this. We need to do that. And we'll talk the game better than anybody else. But, folks, I want you to understand this. God expects harvest from his children. He expects harvest from us. God wants us to catch fish, not just tend after the aquarium. There are far too many churches that are focused inside the four walls of the church. They're internally focused, and they don't honor God by being this way, I believe. My question this morning is this, will we, the people of God, answer the pleas from hell? Jesus pleads with us to reach the lost. People in hell plead with us to reach the lost, and we must answer that call. It's a matter of obedience. Take a look at the Great Commission. Understand this, evangelism is not easy. Jesus, Jesus warned us that the bat we battle the kingdom of darkness and that it will yield itself reluctantly to us. And every soul we win, we have to do so by force. And Satan won't rescind them without a, uh, surrender them without a fight. And while evangelism may not be easy, it remains the top priority of the New Testament church. Churches must be externally focused and poised, trained, and ready to respond to those pleas to rescue the lost. And then we have to aid in the rescue efforts, not just watch. We've got to join the rescue this morning, leaving my house, I pulled up to a traffic light, knowing I was going to be here with you all, and knowing what I, the Lord was leading me to speak on. <coughs> and looked over at the man in the vehicle next to me, and I wondered to myself, who in hell is pleading to God that I'll help reach that man? Who's pleading for us to reach him? Someone probably is. Maybe a grandfather, maybe a dad, maybe an uncle, a mother, a sister. Look at your neighbor this week, my friends, or that coworker, and remind yourself that if they don't know Christ, someone's in hell pleading for you to get involved in their rescue. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, that sounds okay, and I'm not opposed to that, David, but how do I get involved in the rescue? Well, let me give you a couple of ideas about how you might be involved in rescuing lost people. <coughs> First one is this, be the aroma of Christ. Build friendships with people, especially lost people. If you don't know any lost people, then get out and meet some. And just be the aroma of Christ. If you've got a good relationship with someone, if you just love them in the name of Jesus, when you get an opportunity to invite them to church because of your relationship with them, they'll be more likely to come because it's you that invited them. So invest a little bit in them. Do for them. Love them. Be the aroma of Christ to them. Folks, it really doesn't get any easier than that. Secondly, evangelism begins with prayer. Pray for lost people by name. If you're not praying for lost people, then start today. Pray for them by name. That's pretty easy, too, when you get right down to it. And the third thing you can do is learn to share your faith if you don't know how. Now, there's a lot of fear and trepidation when you start talking about witnessing. The bad just kind of, they'd rather hear a sermon on tithe than a sermon on witnessing. I know. But <coughs> witnessing is not the great terrible, frightening thing that people think it is. It's as simple as this. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find good bread. That's all it is. Tell them what God has done in your life. You can stumble and stammer and trip over your tongue every which way but loose. But if you'll just share what God's done in your life and trust the Lord to use it, he'll use it with lost people. You see, my friends, I want us to, I desperately want us to answer those pleas from hell. I want it to be hard to get to hell from South Carolina. You see, those people without Christ, they matter to me because they matter to Jesus. And I know if you really love Jesus, they matter to you too. Now, I know that you all as a church have had a, a rough stretch by some standards over the last little while. And I know that, you know, in most churches we have people who are hurting and maybe people who are frustrated or angry, confused. You, you have that in every church and you all may have more than average. You may have less than average. I don't know. But let me urge you not to let... No, let me plead with you not to let your circumstances, not to let what's going on in this body get you focused inward so much that you don't look at the world that's dying around you. Be externally focused despite what you may be dealing with here. I promise you this, 
if you'll be focused on answering those pleas from hell, you'll be amazed at how few issues you'll have internally. They just kind of fade away. They won't exist anymore. As we close this morning, I want to ask you to do something. I just ask you right where you sit this morning, just to close your eyes, kind of draw a circle around you and the Lord. And I want you to ask God to surface the face of someone who doesn't know Christ in your mind. Just surface the face of someone that you know that doesn't know Christ in your mind. Perhaps it's a neighbor or a family member, a friend, a coworker. Maybe it's a person who cuts your grass or checks you out at the grocery store or a teller at the bank, a clerk somewhere where you do business often. And once you have that person's face I want you to take your, your bulletin or your Bible or something. Only you're going to see this. And I just want you to write their name down. Just write their name down somewhere. You can go ahead and do that now if you want to do that. Just write their name down or their initials, whatever you want to write. I'm going to ask you to do three things concerning that person that, whose name, that face that God surfaced in your mind. I'm going to ask you to do three things. First, I'm going to ask you to do this. You pray for their salvation until God accomplishes it or he calls you home, whichever comes first. You just pray every day for God to save that person. Secondly, ask God to give you opportunities to build a relationship with them, to invite them to church, and to push them towards him. You see, I believe we, as Christians, we are all either gathering people to the cross or we're pushing people away from the cross. Just ask God for opportunities to pull them to the cross, to gather them to the foot of Jesus. And the third thing, ask God to give you the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And when he opens the door, you trip, stumble, and fall through it, but you do the very best you can to tell them what Jesus means to you, and you trust God for the results of that. That's not your responsibility. The results are God's, not yours. We're just responsible for sharing. Finally, if you're here this morning without Jesus as Savior, I know that statistically most of you here are not pleading for personal rescue. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ as Savior, I want you to know this. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to save you. He wants a relationship with you. And there's probably someone in hell pleading right now that someone like me will tell you this message so that you don't wind up in that terrible, awful place with them. And if that describes you this morning, we have a time of invitation in a few moments. I want you to come forward. We'd love to talk with you about how you can leave here today with a new life and eternity that's going to be great. During the week of Christmas several years ago, it's been more than several now, uh, my family was on vacation in the southwestern part of Virginia where my dad had grown up, and um, we were there for, for Christmas. And um, on Christmas Eve, my, my son Josh and I were tasked with making a run to the local Walmart. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone to Walmart on Christmas Eve, but I would not put it on my bucket list if I were you. It's just not worth it. It was a zoo. Uh, people there were pushing and shoving. They're, they were crazy. They were fighting over the last toys and the last this, the last that. It was, you know, and I'm a big guy and I was afraid. But while we were there, an announcement came over the public address system. It said this, attention employees and shoppers. We have a code Adam. There's an eight-year-old boy with blonde hair, black tennis shoes, wearing a light blue shirt and a Jeff Gordon hat, who has disappeared. Please help us look for him. Well, the entire store went on alert. Of course, there were some who were afraid that someone had abducted this little boy, and there was a sense of urgency and purpose as just about everyone forgot about those last-minute shopping items we were looking for and began to fan out all over the store, searching. The police were called in, and employees were stationed at the doors so that no one was allowed to leave, and for the next few minutes, both in shoppers and employees, we fed out across that whole store, looking in every good hiding spot for a little boy. And after about 10 minutes, the announcement was made, cancel code Adam, the little boy has been found. And then I witnessed something absolutely amazing at Walmart on Christmas Eve. People who had been pushing and shoving and fighting and said unkind things to one another over the last opportunity to grab toys and other things for Christmas, who'd gone out searching for this boy, were now hugging total strangers and slapping each other on the back and smiling and high fives and shaking hands. And there was a, 
It was an amazing thing. They had a unity and a sense of urgency about finding this little boy, and when all of us had that same focus and he was found, we all celebrated together. It was an amazing thing. A few minutes later, as Josh and I were heading to the checkout, a boy fitting the broadcast description was receiving quite a tongue lashing from his mother. And after that, as we returned to the van, I thought, man, wouldn't it be great if every church had that sense of urgency, that sense of purpose and unity, as these total strangers did in Walmart just a few minutes ago, as they went out and searched, as we went out and searched for this little boy, wouldn't, church, wouldn't it be great if the church did that same urgency and unity and purpose to go out and search for lost people in their communities? If they went out and looked for people headed towards eternity in hell, with that kind of energy and that kind of purpose, and that kind of unity, wouldn't that be great? Can you imagine what that'd be like? Wouldn't that be great, folks? Would it? Will you? Will you do that? I plead with you to. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word and the way it speaks to our lives. And Father, I thank you for these folks here. I pray, Lord, that um, as we have this time of invitation, Father, that you would move in their lives, that you would touch their hearts, Lord, and you would speak to them, God, in a way that only you can. Lord, I don't know what their situations are and, and what you would have to do in their lives, Lord, but I pray that as we take this moment, Lord, that you would um, have your way in each of our lives. Lord, I pray that you would speak to each of your children here in the way you want them to hear and what you'd say to them what they need to hear. Lord, I pray if there are any here who don't know you, Lord, that they would come running down the aisle, Lord, to trust Christ. Lord, for those of us who know you already, I pray, God, that if we're not involved in responding to the pleas from hell to rescue the lost, Lord, I pray that in obedience to Jesus and because of our love for him, we would answer those pleas. Lord, help us to be busy about your kingdom's work, focused on what you want us focused on, Lord. Lord, we love you, and I pray that our actions would demonstrate our love. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 416. Would you turn there and stand, please?